renowned for their pursuit of spiritual enlightenment, committed to their belief in non-violence. Tibetans have been peacefully resisting China's occupation for decades. The remote and mainly Buddhist territory has vital strategic significance for Beijing. And there is no China-India border, there's only the Tibet-India border. Beijing claims sovereignty over the region, but stands accused of repressing religious, cultural and political freedom. In the face of this oppression, Tibetans have taken their struggle for autonomy abroad. So it's very much possible to have government in, uh, in exile. And that's what they've done, establishing a parliament, a democratic process, and even issuing identification documents. When a non-violent fight for freedom is against one of the world's most powerful countries, you need a unique strategy. So Tibetans have created a democracy that's not defined by geography. The founder of this system, the 14th Dalai Lama, is the spiritual leader that unites the community. Internationally celebrated, he is ambassador to the world for Tibetans' autonomy. We have been quite fortunate, mainly because of the uh, personal charisma of, of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the popularity of His Holiness the Dalai Lama that uh, our movement has sustained uh, over the years. Pempa Sering is the current Sikyong, the elected head of government in exile, also known as the Central Administration. Tibetans around the world voted him into office. You know, most of the Tibetans are in India, and then about 10,000, uh, now it could be anything between uh, 69, 70,000 Tibetans in India and about 10,000 Tibetans in Nepal, about 1,500 in Bhutan, which makes it about 80,000 in India, Nepal, Bhutan, and rest of the other uh, 50,000 Tibetans in exile are scattered in more than 25 different countries. Scattered they may be, but Tibetans are connected by the central administration. The head office and the parliament are located in the Indian town of Dharamsala. The 45 members of the parliament tackle topics like finance, immigration and Tibetan education. All these offices uh, that we function from Dharamsala in India are registered with Indian societies. So uh, whatever social welfare activities that we do or other activities that we do uh, are very much in conformity with Indian laws. And then we have framed our own charter. We have a cabinet, we have a parliament, we have a Supreme Justice Commission, the three pillars of democracy. Then we also have election commission, the Auditor General's Office, Public Service Commission, just as any other democracies uh, in independent countries. <laughs> The central administration is supported by activist groups across the globe. Institutions like this one, Freedom in Tibet, here in London. All right, so go ahead, tell me, this This is the office you work in? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as you can see, it's not too big. We make do with what we have. So, we're a relatively small team, we're about 12. Most employees work remotely, and this office serves as a storage space for campaign t-shirts and protest banners. This is the stuff that we bring to protests. So these are normally ones that we design ourselves. So something like this. So, so something as simple as, you know, liberate Hong Kong, because we work with other, other activist groups as well, just to amplify our causes and our struggles as much as we can. And then we have this one here, Tibet is not a part of China. So this is, yeah. this is what I'm noticing actually as you're pulling yeah. out the signs, that it's yeah. not just your organization that you work yeah. with, and it's not just the Tibetans, there's Oibos yeah. there, and you have Hong Kong Absolutely. Um, as well. So as You collaborate with them then regularly, is that...? Is that for, yeah, so what we do is we collaborate as much as we can, we support each other's causes. I think the overall goal is to amplify our voices, because we're all, we all have the same common enemy. We all have the same entity that's working to suppress us, so we need to work to fight back together. Mm -hmm. That's how we have the most impactful result. 
Mm-hmm. Tenzin's family immigrated from Tibet. He's never been to the place he calls home. But thanks to the community in exile, he's learned the Tibetan language in the UK and is committed to the cause. At Free Tibet, we work on different campaigns. They range from lobbying MPs to ban a certain Chinese company, certain Chinese products, whether it's human, human rights abuses happening in Tibet to certain areas, to individuals, we'll call them out. We'll ask the, we'll try to garner Western support in order to help the situation for the individual, for the group, or for the nation itself. We've been working on trying to ban a Chinese security company, and we've been campaigning for a, a while now, and we're seeing huge, huge wins. The UK government have decided to stop and close down all CCTV high vision cameras in all of their departments. China has been growing into the second largest economy in the world in the past few decades. Tell me how you feel about that. Watching China grow to be the second largest economy in the world, they say that it's the fastest developing nation, not only economically, but socially in these other areas. But this is on the back of their ethnic minorities. This is on the back of Tibetans whose resources they have used. So I can't help but feel such, it's not even anger, it's just pure frustration. Like they not only did this to us, but now they show off to the world that there's some advanced civilization. Western powers support the Tibetan government in exile, but they also play the role in China's economic growth. The president of the government in exile believes that things are changing. So these days, the interdependence has increased so much that any small event in some part of the world will have its replication on other parts of the world. So therefore, uh, the Ukraine conflict uh, has been an eye-opener for the Europeans, particularly because it is right on their door. So uh, earlier, of course, they look at uh, uh, authoritarian regimes with a different perspective. Uh, as long as they make enough economic gains, it's fine with them. And that is what Europeans have been doing. That's what many other countries have been doing. And that's also the reason why China also benefited so much from the uh, developed countries. Uh, it's not just in terms of investment, but also in terms of uh, uh, technology and other things that made China what it is today. So uh, we are all responsible for creating this monster called China. And uh, because of the developments in Ukraine, we uh, get this feeling uh, that there is definitely a change in perception on China in the last one and a half, two years uh, than before. Having a form of a government in exile for Tibetans is more of an identity issue than a political issue, and they try to hold on to that identity with these kind of events. Tibetans New Year in the middle of February, in the middle of London. Large crowds attend these events, which provide an opportunity for Tibetans to pay voluntary taxes and update their documentation. So this is what we in the Tibetan community know as the Green Book. It's a sort of identification card. It's, um, it's in a way a sort of passport, but it's more so that the Tibetan government have proof that you are not only Tibetan, but they can also use your information as a part of their wider database. So with this Green Book, what it allows you to do is it allows you to take part in parliamentary elections. It allows you to vote for your regional leaders as well as the president as well of the Central Tibetan Administration. The Chinese government makes it difficult for Tibetans to obtain passports. The Central Administration's Green Book is a way for Tibetans to proudly express their identity and support each other. In order to get a green book, you have to make a voluntary sort of contribution, so no one is forced to pay it. But if you do pay for it, what you're doing is you're helping to give authority and a sort of legitimacy to the central Tibetan government and the Tibetan government in exile. And in doing that, it also helps to fund welfare programs for Tibetans living in uh, throughout India. Also, some even in Nepal as well, they're able to be helped. And it helps with students as well in terms of being funded for scholarships and other things like that.
Despite its power, China's efforts to repress Tibetan culture and its people have not succeeded. Instead, it's created a global nation united in their proud and peaceful struggle. Over the last 62 years, 63 years, His Holiness went around the world with his folded hands. Now the challenge for the Tibetans uh, is now to see whether the 130,000 Tibetans in exile will be able to match up. Exiled Tibetans believe the territory that is known as the roof of the world will one day become their home again. Their dream of autonomy is very much alive. Okay.